Great. Go ahead. Thanks, Richard, for the intro. So, Samantha, do we start by just introducing ourselves, maybe? Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. Yeah. So, so who, are you? <laughs> <laughs> who, who are you? Who are you? Go ahead, please. Um, uh, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Samantha. I'm a geoinformatics specialist at CSE in Finland and also a PhD student at Aalto University and the Finnish Geospatial Research Institute. And I've been going through this whole code refinery thing from starting as a learner a few years back to being an exercise leader and now also instructor. And I'm very yeah. excited to be teaching you about the reproducible research and then also tomorrow the documentation lesson. Thank you. So, and I'm I'm Tor Wigfeld. I um, work in Stockholm at the ENCCS Center, the Euro CC National Competence Center, Sweden, uh, where we uh, we work with HPC AI, raising the competence uh, in these areas in Sweden and beyond. We organize lots of workshops, actually. So, if you're interested in that, uh, have a look at ENCCS.se. And then uh, before that, I was at the PDC Center for HPC in Stockholm. And there I got involved with Code Refinery already from the start, actually, 2016. I was um, working half time for Code Refinery for many years, but now uh, I'm not, but uh, I'm contributing as much as I can as part of my, my new job. <clears throat> okay, so that's enough about us. I think we should uh, get started, actually. We have lots of interesting material to, to go through. And it's my turn to start, yeah? Yes. So let me share a portion of my screen. So you can find the link to the lesson material in the HackMD already under one reproducible research. I hope my screen looks good. Looks good to me. Better, one second. It's HackMD, no, now it looks right. Okay, excellent. All right, so reproducible research. We had this discussion before we started today, before the hour, that the whole workshop, in my opinion, could be called reproducible research. But now we have this one lesson called reproducible research, where we gather a few very useful tools, uh, which often, in many cases, build on version control, but they go beyond. They handle workflows, reproducible workflows, containers, reproducible environments, and package managers. And all these uh, separately contribute to better reproducibility and they can even be used all at once. Uh, so uh, last week was all about re uh, version control. We will still uh, use version control this week, but we assume now that we are relatively familiar and comfortable with Git and Git is, is part of some of the exercises, some of the work we will do this week. And I hope this will all tie nicely together uh, a, a full picture of reproducibility. So there are different dependencies. I hope everyone has installed uh, the Conda environment as part of the setup instructions for the workshop. Specifically, we need Python and Snakemake. We will not focus on Python as a programming language. So don't worry if you don't write Python yourself. It's mostly about having something to show. And then there are these optional uh, dependencies, Docker and Make. So we will only demo these, uh, but uh, you don't need them on your machine. Anyway, so uh, this is an overview of the episodes. I will start with the motivation. Samantha takes over to talk about uh, how to organize your projects in a, in a structured and good way and tell you about dependencies, how you handle them, how you... Uh, and code them. I will talk about the recording computational steps. Samantha talks about the environments, that's containers. And I will wrap up with good ways to share code and data. And uh, I think you have the link to the lesson from HackMD, if not elsewhere. It's also from the workshop webpage here. You can uh, click this link here from day four. I will jump into the motivation. So should research software and data be reproducible? Are they? I think I will revisit your interesting answers in HackMD in a minute to address what you think about this question. But let's start with uh, a comic. 
a PhD student is talking to a professor, the supervisor. The professor is telling the student about a new project. Don't worry, you don't have to start your code from scratch. You can reuse the software that the previous person on the project wrote several years ago. And then the student starts asking, are there instructions for how to use it? I doubt it. Is the code commented? Not likely. Where are the files? Who knows? This is going to be painful, isn't it? Yeah, just a scratch. This might be relatable to some of you. It is to some extent for me. Another light or maybe not so light uh, start of the lesson here, a scary anecdote. Can happen to people, it can happen to anyone. A group of researchers obtain some great results and they submit their work to maybe some fancy journal. Reviewers ask for new figures, which often happens, some different types of analysis. The researchers start working, trying to do what the uh, referees uh, ask, ask them to, but they can't really find some data. They cannot really reproduce. They don't know which parameter they used in some step or whatever, and they just can't do it. And the manuscript is still languishing in the drawer. Tragic, tragic story. And this, it's an avoidable scenario. And hopefully what we talk about today uh, can avoid some of these situations from arising. Here's just a definition from the US National Science Foundation subcommittee on replicability, or just a definition. Reproducibility refers to the ability of a researcher to duplicate the result of a prior study. And reproducibility is a minimum necessary condition for a finding to be believable and informative. So the right thing to do, the ethical thing to do in science is to use all the tools available for making our research more reproducible. And so why, why all the talk? You may be familiar with this. Uh, this is a, these are two figures here from a paper in 2016. In Nature, it's a survey uh, where researchers were asked, is there a reproducibility crisis? Have you failed to reproduce an experiment? And sadly, a large majority have either uh, think that, that there's either a significant crisis of reproducibility or a slight crisis. So not very positive, but um, fortunately we have technology. There are new tools being developed. There are already excellent tools. Awareness is increasing, not only among researchers, but among journals as well, that we need to publish more uh, than only the final product of a research, the paper itself. I see you nod, Samantha. Do you think this is a, a good uh, description? Yeah, and I think it also depends a lot on the individual. Like I can relate a lot to do this on the left side. Um, have you failed to reproduce an experiment like my own? Yes, I have failed with that as well in the very beginning when I did not know about all the tools and did not know that it's actually really worth to spend the time on making my own stuff reproducible also for myself and for others. Yeah, exactly. I probably omitted that. So reproducibility is not only for others, right? It's for yourself. If you read it, if you like this, yeah, well, I covered it in the scary anecdote. I mean, not being able to reproduce your own stuff. Uh, we can identify a few factors that can play a role. So insufficient documentation on how an experiment or simulation is conducted. Uh, the, some data is unavailable. Software is unavailable. It's difficult to create the right software environment. Missing libraries, we don't know which versions. Or difficult to rerun the right steps in the right order. So we really want to avoid any type of miracle occurring when <laughs> when we generate results. It should all be documented. And I think this pyramid here really is descriptive. The article is only the, the top of the pyramid. Below it, we need documentation, we need code, we need data, we need environment. Software in our case now, but of course, also in experimental sciences, uh, everything needs to be documented and well-defined. So we are talking about reproducibility you can generalize it, so to speak. Uh, there are other uh, concepts here, rep replicability, robustness, and generalizability. So we're here, 
reproducible, we have the same data, same analysis, we should be getting the same result. Replicability is where you have different data, but the same analysis. Robustness, same data, different analysis should give the right, the same, same, same conclusion at least, maybe not the same result exactly. Generalizability, different data, different analysis. We can generalize the finding. But we're here in the top left corner right now. So here you already were prompted to answer this question in HackMD. So let me just have a look at the questions here, uh, the answers to, to this icebreaker question. So, <clears throat> so computer programs are expected to produce, produce the same result, uh, same output for the same inputs. Is that always true for research software? Clearly you have strong opinions. You have many good answers here. Definitely Do you want solved. to share the HackMD while you're uh, here? Maybe that's a good idea, yeah. Sorry about the formatting here. Have you picked anything out from here, Samantha? Any interesting point to bring up? So this morning, actually, there was a, we, you know, in the studio here started talking about, uh, oops, the, started talking about randomness. We're not gonna talk about random number generators today and its uh, consequences on reproducibility, but the discussion was sort of sidetracked a little bit by that, but how to deal with randomness in stochastic simulations will actually be covered on the last day of the workshop in the testing lesson. So I, I noticed here there is some sort of deep technical um, arguments here. So GPU programming, you need to, to ex state explicitly that the memory transfers between CPU and GPU or within the GPU have to be done exactly the same way. So I think this points to hardware uh, limitations sometimes, you know, summations do not always have to lead to the same result. It depends on the, you know, the order in which summations are done, compilers, optimizations. So that's a very difficult problem to tackle. Uh, I guess the deepest level of reproducibility we cover today, the containers will maybe address that point to some extent. Yeah, but, I've also yeah. seen often now here this uh, uncertain which version of software was used, uncertain which package version was used, and we will actually talk about this also a little bit later yeah. in this very lesson. Yeah. Oh, Interpreter version has changed. Yeah. yeah, so versioning is a universal problem uh, with, you know, it that really affects reproducibility. And there are some famous uh, scary stories about retractions, uh, high level retractions because of stuff like that. Well, I think I would like to hand over the word to you now, Samantha. I'm done with this. Uh, I hope you feel motivated to listen carefully what we have to say now in the following two hours. So take over screen, please. Yes. Okay. So um, we are now gonna start about start to talk about reproducibility and uh, what you can do to make your project, your code, um, more reproducibilities. And in the essence, it starts already with how you organize your files uh, for your project um, so that you later can find find your stuff again, like know exactly where to look when you are looking for the data set or the code used. But also then uh, if you publish it, for example, via GitHub, um, that others can easily find their way into where you have your documentation, where do you have the source code and all these kind of things. Um, so the directory, directory structure for your project is a rather important first step that you can do to increase reproducibility of, um, uh, of your code and your uh, whole project. So um, as a base rule, it's a good starting point uh, to keep all the files associated with, a, with one project, that is one, one unit in a single folder. And uh, this is only like 
uh, a guideline and it's not like one fits all. So everyone has their own like ways of dealing with it. So this is just a, uh, like one way of how you could deal with it. One way that hopefully will make it easier for you in the future to, to find your stuff again. Um, and then have an, have an, having a consistent and also informative directory structure also will help you when you switch between projects that everything will look more or less the same like the first level you have a data folder you have a source code folder and this so you know every time where to look for things then we have already seen maybe last week a little bit the readme files that are uh, if you want to automatically add it by github to your repository um, that you can use to describe like what the project is about what kind of things you have in your folder um, but also without github you can always have have like a readme file that or it's always helpful to have a readme file to to give an overview of the project also for the later you if you come back to the project um, also for example meeting notes or decisions made based on the project could be in this directory um, and here you can see a uh, example directory structure. So we have the project name as the um, like root folder of the project. We have the readme where you can write everything that needs to be known about the project itself. And then you can have, for example, another readme in a data folder that describes the data uh, and what has been done to it. You can have uh, intermediate results in a process data folder. Um, if you're writing a manuscript about it, you can also have that with everything here. The results uh, that you use to then like write the manuscript, for example, can be there. Then the source code <coughs> with the license file and then also something called the requirements.txt or uh, environment.yml. Maybe you have seen that we will be talking about this in a bit, uh, what that is. Um, and then also the documentation can be um, right there with everything. Yeah, we'll actually learn that tomorrow. Yeah. So oh, yeah. how how to track how to have the documentation side by side with your code. Yes. And uh, you know recommendations on how to do that. Exactly. Yeah, we'll be talking about this tomorrow. And um, then uh, we have already learned about the version control. And we can, for example, have the source directory version controlled and not the rest, not the data and not the everything. Um, but you can also have multiple of these subfolders version controlled or even the whole project folder. It depends on your, your use case. Um, then also we've seen this .git ignore file and how to use it. So if you have like some sensitive data that uh, you, for, overview reasons need to have in the same folder, you can always put them there to not track them with uh, Git. Um, and then also, this is a very good, good tip. I've very long not done this, but recently started doing it. Uh, if you're using uh, Git to track, your, to track your files, and for example, you have a version of the code uh, at the point where you submitted uh, either a, the thesis or like a manuscript submitted to a journal, then you can use this git tag uh, to tag that version so that when you get the reviewer commands uh, and you have afterward, after submission worked on your code, you know exactly like which versions these reviewers have seen and um, can then relate to that and talk about it. And then we saw already in Thor's uh, pyramid that um, also publication, the article is only the top of the iceberg, but um, also the publications can be like reproducible. And there's many, many tools that can help with that, where you can also collaborate with others, uh, where you can use different, different uh, text-based formats to write and then also see the rendered version of your of your manuscript. Um, personally, I only have 
experience now with this overleaf, which is a very nice lattice editor where you can, like, you don't have to install any, any kind of lattice stuff on your own computer, but you can use it like from the web browser and you can share it with everyone. And even people that are not using lattice as their, um, as their tool of choice or that don't like it, they can just add comments there and don't have to uh, work directly with the, with the source code of the article. Um, Thor, do you have any experience with any of these other tools? HackMD we have used now here in the uh, course. HackMD, Google Docs. I mean, I've used Google Docs. Overleaf is very good, I like it. Yeah. It, it's a tool that's sort of needed. Um, I mean, LaTeX is often what journalists want. Um, well, okay. either that or, or something like uh, Microsoft Word or, or DocX format. And the fact that Overleaf exists to make it easier for authors to collaborate and to write uh, for nicely formatted uh, journal articles is, is just fantastic. Yeah, and the nice thing is also many journal journals nowadays uh, provide these templates for Lattes, so you can just load them into your Overleaf, for example, and edit them there with your, add your manuscript there. So you don't have to deal with the formatting yourself. And uh, then there's also tools like Jupyter Notebooks that we will also be talking uh, tomorrow, I guess, or one of the upcoming days. Um, and also Binder, we'll have a look at. And um, one tip here, if you want to practice these reproducibility skills, uh, you can join something called a repro hack where you can, um, sometimes choose a journal article and try to reproduce it, for example. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Have you been to one? Yeah, yeah. Surprisingly difficult sometimes. <laughs> and um, there you then also learn like what to look out for in your own, um, in your own publications. And if you have tried to reproduce, uh, replicate um, someone else's paper then you then you know like what you what you need to write in your own paper to make it more possible for others or more easily possible also um, and maybe we can collect this one in the hackmd if someone could copy this question how do you collaborate on academic on writing academic papers just to collect a little bit the different tools people use and what you like about them so maybe someone else can get in a can be inspired and take also a look into these tools. And um, we have one exercise here, but I will just be showing this to you. Now you don't have to go into your exercise groups for this one. So we have one example project here, um, which uh, follows the, the project structure guidelines given above. So we can take a look in here. It's the word count repository in the code refinery, which is a public template. So you can all look at it. And you can see we have some things that we talked about here, the source, the results, process data, a manuscript, the docs, data, and then something called a binder folder. You will learn about that also later. Um, and a readme with like what it's all about. So this is a program that, that will count words in a, in a text and it will plot the, these counts as bar charts of the 10 most common words and then test Zip's law on the two most common words. And Zip's law is, um, it says that the most frequent word in a text will occur about twice as often as the second frequent. So it will test this law on the given text. And then there is some word come, sorry. Yeah, no, no, just um, the reason for digging into this repository is that we'll actually use it later. It's a very nice, well, hopefully, uh, I think a well reproducible project and we'll use it in some exercises later today. And this launch binder button is very cool. You don't have to push it now, but uh, we'll see how that works. It's something you can do with your own projects. You 
put this button there and anyone can press it and op there's, there's a Jupyter notebook that opens up in the cloud and you can run the analysis uh, interactively. Yeah, it's really cool. You should try it, everyone, <laughs> at some point. Um, there is also some notes here that it's what it was inspired by, where you can find the documentation. So the documentation is here hosted on Read the Docs that you might also see in many places. And we'll also mention it tomorrow a little bit during the documentation lesson. Um, and that we will actually use it in two lessons in our workshop. Um, and then we have here the git ignore file, um, a configuration file for the read the docs documentation, a license file. So it's always good to have here a make so file about, and sorry. And the last lesson today, I think the social coding talks about licenses. This oh, yeah. is something people should care about, actually. It doesn't sound maybe interesting to many people, but uh, it's important and uh, there will be a good discussion about it later today. Yeah, how to choose a license and why to choose a license and all that, those things you will learn today. Um, then we have uh, something called a make file and a snake file. And uh, these are, well, workflow related files um that you can use to to write like a kind of a recipe on how the workflow is going of uh of what your program does and uh, tor will talk about that in a in a bit and um, then we also have this environment.yaml file um, and that i will actually be continuing with now so this is one way of um storing the dependencies that uh, this this code is now dependent on other on other packages, and this environment.yaml file is is one way on how we can store that. Looks like this. Yes. So in this um, short part here, we learned that uh, an organized project directory structure can already help with reproducibility and can be the first step to making your whole project reproducible. Were there any qu questions that you would like to bring up from the HackMD about this part? Um, not really. I think uh, there are many questions coming in, but they're getting good answers too. So I th don't okay. think I could dwell on it. It will be interesting to hear about the dependencies now. Okay, then let's go to the dependencies. So um, you've already written it like in the very first question that we put in the HackMD that sometimes it can be a problem that you don't know like what kind of versions of packages have been used in a certain project. And uh, there is a few different ways that one can record the dependencies and we will look into that in the next 15 minutes a little bit. Um, so yeah, our code often depends on other codes and those then might also depend on other code and that can go on forever like everything depends on something else and it can be a long line line of different dependencies so how um how can we control these dependencies we have very good grasp on now how we can control our code but how to really like control this this long long list of dependencies and there is something called this 10 year challenge so if you have uh, written uh, some code uh, five or 10 years ago and have not touched it since then, uh, is it actually possible to run that code today? Um, or what would, you, what would you need to do now to, to make it possible to run it again? Um, very often it might not be possible to run it today if you have not recorded the dependencies or if the versions are not available anymore. Um, because all the different packages like evolve over time, some, some uh, more, some less, but yeah, there's usually always people working, working on getting the, um, on, yeah, 
get it, getting uh, uh, along with the with their code. And then uh, we can also end up in something called the dependency hell that we have uh, that we work, for example, on different projects uh, which depend on uh, different code, which again depends on different code, which might be depend on different versions of different code. So there is this view here. So we have like different for Python, for example, we have uh, the Python and then we might have um, different versions of Python that we need. Then we have um, Anaconda Python, which we'll be talking about now and then this pip. And uh, there can be a lot of a lot of mess that easily that easily um, comes up when when dealing with these dependencies. <clears throat> but luckily, we have um, a lot of tools that help us with this dependency management. And all of these tools, uh, Conda, Anaconda, pip, virtual env, pip env, py env, poetry, these requirements, the text, what we have maybe seen before, they try to solve uh, these problems. So um, they try to solve that you can install a specific set uh, of dependencies, possibly with the well-defined versions, if you know like what, one set of versions of your dependencies that works together, you can uh, use these tools to recreate that very same environment with these depend with these very same versions. Um, you can uh, record the versions for all the dependencies. You can also create isolated environments for different projects that might need, for example, a different Python version. Like I have some code that uh, depends actually on Python 2.7 still. So I might want to have an environment where I have Python 2.7 while everything else works with Python 3.10 or whatever. Um, already, which without these tools is not possible to have like different versions of Python or any other language also. Um, and then also these provide tools uh, and services to, to share your own package. So if you have written some code and you would like to make it easy for others to use your code, you can create your own package and share it, for example, on PyPy or uh, Conda. And um, these also help you to make sure that you, you yourself know your dependencies. So, you know which versions you are using, you, you are aware that you are using like an older version of this package or another package. Um, so they help with a lot of things. Well, we have one small exercise here, uh, which we can do in the HackMD. So I'm just wondering, I would... Samantha, yeah. so to interrupt, but um, we are a little behind schedule. I'm thinking if we should do this in HackMD or if okay. you wanna discuss it uh okay sure okay. yeah i can discuss it also yeah or we can discuss it um so we have now here different uh, requirements the text files which is uh, one way of like writing down your dependencies and there is uh one code where it depends on a number of packages. We know that because it imports lots of packages into the code, but there's no requirements file available. So that's rather rather bad, like because we have no idea like which version of the different um, of the different packages are used, uh, what packages are actually used. We would have to go through the whole code to find out what packages we need to install to our computer to actually use this code from this A. Um, then we have B. Would you like to say something about B, Thor? Well, it's definitely a hundred times better than A. <laughs> that is. Without the requirements, you know, who knows? I mean, maybe you can try to reproduce the, you know, make it workable on your computer, but maybe not. Maybe it fails. So this hopefully works. 
be, but it can also fail because versions of programs, of packages, of libraries, they move, they evolve over time. So you might be, a code might be relying on a feature in NumPy, which is deprecated, for example. So it's, yeah. it's good, but it's not optimal. And then with C, we're getting better. So now we have uh, with this equal signs and then a version number, we actually specify which version of SciPy and NumPy, SumPy and Click we want to use. So everyone who will use this very same requirements file will also get the very same versions. And then we also have some uh, dependencies that are from a GitHub repository. And while here in B, we, um, we take the master branch. So whatever at the, given, at the given point in time is the master branch is taken there. Um, in this case of C, we take a, a commit hash. Uh, so a specific commit to this GitHub repository um, is like the dependency of in this case, or a tag. And uh, then we have D, where we also have the same projects here, this some project and another project, uh, but they're also given with, given with versions, um, which is, I guess, the safest option that you can go with to make everyone have the same. And it's also, for us, it's, it's more easily readable. This uh, will probably lead to the very same thing as this if it's uh, meant to be, but uh, we can understand this better that it's version one, two, three, instead of trying to read this commit hash. Anything more here? No, I think you mentioned the important thing that uh, using the semantic versioning 1.2.3, it's more transparent and you, you can relate it to the version history of the project. While with a Git hash, you know, you will need to navigate in the uh, Git repository to sh know which version it corresponds to. Yeah. So, um, we talked, or uh, I mentioned already this pip and pypy before. So pypy is the Python package index, and it's uh, one of the standard places to share Python packages. And you can also share mixed mixed language packages um, that are wrapped in a Python layer. And you can see here a little bit how, how it can be used from the command line. So you can install some package. You can specify a version of a package that you want to install to your computer. You can um, freeze all the versions that you of packages that you currently have on your computer or in your environment to a requirement the text, uh, which will then, no, not, sorry, um, which will then give you a full list of all the all the packages that you have installed on your computer and the versions and where you got it from. And uh, you can also then you or someone else um, can then use this requirements the text file to install the very same dependent Dependencies to their own environment with pip install and this minus r. So well, this is um, of course, sorry, uh, very Python centric. Not everyone is writing code in Python, but um, there are other languages covered below. Some useful links if you're writing code in other languages. But many people still need to interact with Python because other packages that they might want to use uh, are written in Python, and it's good to know how to handle the dependencies. Yes, and there's also a link here if you're uh, creating your own package and want to share it on how to do that. And uh, with pip, you can also install um, packages directly from GitHub using the tag or the hash as seen above. Um, then we have uh, Conda, which sometimes causes a bit of confusion with Anaconda, mini Conda. Uh, so Conda is the, the package manager uh, and also environment manager. And uh, it's not only for Python, 
but for any language and also different binaries are available. Uh, it's created by Continuum Analytics and it's part of this Anaconda and Miniconda, which you probably have already installed as part of the installation instructions for this course. And, but Conda can also be installed alone. Uh, it's open source and um, you can uh, manage isolated environments with it. Uh, you can manage the dependencies with it. And it also allows you to create and share Conda packages. And um, in the installation instructions, we recommend it to install mini Conda that has already some packages coming with it. Uh, and is like a lightweight, lightweight alternative to the full Anaconda. And um, originally I've, I'd planned to show you a little bit these uh, different commands here, but because we have an exercise coming where you can play around yourself a little bit with Conda, um, I would say I just talk through it or what do you think, Tor? Well, I and think hopefully most of the people attending now will have installed the code refinery conda environment so they will have some initial exposure yep. some idea and i'm also hoping that the exercise is somewhat uh, clear so people will know what to do so i'm just thinking about the time i don't yep. want to be stressing but um, uh, no. yeah if you just cover some very brief uh, points and then we can move on to the exercise yeah. Um, so what you have been doing all probably as part of the installation instructions is to create uh, the Conda environment called Code Refinery from our environment.yaml. And in the same way, you could also use a requirements.txt file that is uh, either written by yourself or um, provided by someone um, using pip. Um, the environment.yaml is the, is the conda file where all the dependencies are recorded. Uh, you can also do create environments without these files and then just manually install one package after another. So you could use conda create and then a name of an environment, for example, code refinery2, um, and then install some packages into it. and. The nice thing is that you like know then exactly where these um, where these packages are installed, and if you mess it up with the dependencies and suddenly nothing works anymore, or if you are done with the project, then you can just delete this whole directory um, either directly or using also Conda uh, clean, which is down here, and you can find out where your environments are stored and where all the information is stored using this conda info minus e. Um, and from the instructions, you also know that like in the beginning of each course day, we need to activate this um, code refinery environment using conda activate and then code refinery to be within the environment to be able to use all the packages that we have installed as part of the installation instruction. And then in the end of the day, if you're done with, when you're done with code refinery and want to go to your work and you maybe have a different Conda environment for your work stuff, you first deactivate the Conda, uh, the code refinery environment, and then you can activate your my work uh, environment to, to have all the packages that you need for your work ready to go. Um, yeah, I mentioned you can also sh share uh, your pa your own packages using Conda that is done via this channel, Conda Forge, where everyone can like become part of the GitHub organization and write a recipe for your own code. And then it's available for anyone else that can then use Conda install and then specify the channel with minus C uh, on the forge and then the name of your package. So if you want to share it with your colleagues or with the world, then on the forge is a very nice way and they have very good tutorials and how, how it's done. And then it can 
it is also automatically built for all the different um, operating systems and tested there. But yeah, let's go to the exercise now. Um, I'd say 15 minutes, did we say? Yeah, until uh, five minutes past the hour. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this means uh, exercise rooms or people this can easily be done independently by Twitch uh, followers. So just follow the instructions. It gets you, it gives you a good introduction to what you can do with Conda. I maybe, I don't know if you already mentioned, I wasn't always, uh, uh, wasn't, was, I was distracted at a, for a moment. Um, Conda is language independent, right? So it's used a lot for installing Python packages and dependencies, but it's, it's basically uh, language independent. You can install other things with Conda too. You can install system libraries with Conda. But yeah, let's not take away time for the, from the exercise. So until five minutes past the hour, we have um, an exercise session. Yes, and you can write your questions in the HackMD and we will check. Yeah, out. and we'll and also let us know how it's going. Yeah, yeah. So I'll stay just uh, update the uh, box where you can say that you're done or you need more time or whatever. Okay. See you See back you in five minutes past the hour, yeah? Okay, okay, we're back. So I hope you had time to play a little bit around with Conda. It can be a very useful tool um, if you ever ended up in this mess that you needed different versions of different packages. So it's worth to know. But then also um, right below the exercise, you can find a long list of other dependency and also environment management tools that you can take a look at if you, for example, don't like Honda or just want to have a look what else is out there. Um, for example, you might have noticed that sometimes it can take a bit long for Conda to resolve uh, the dependencies. Then, for example, this Mamba tool is something to look into. And then also for different languages, we have, for example, for R, here a list of tools, C, C++, Fortran. And also Thor was just telling us about the nice way it, it, this package management works in, in Julia, if you're working with Julia. Um, and then there's also two interesting reads about semantic versioning and why not semantic versioning maybe. Okay, but with that, I think I'll give over to Tor. And yeah, Tor. well, and I will start with uh, announcing a break. So. All right, welcome back from the break. Uh, is my screen visible now? Not yet. Here we go. So I hope uh, you learned something useful uh, about Conda and environments in general. This is an important part of reproducibility in computational research. This is where we left off. Uh, I will now jump to the next section right here. Recording computational steps. So the questions we are addressing is how can we create a reproducible workflow when to use scientific workflow systems. Uh, it again contains some, a fun exercise. So let's have a look at uh, the word count project again that uh, Samantha introduced to you. It's a hobby, it's a toy problem. It's a Python problem which counts words and text. We don't need to care much about the details, but it's useful to have a semi-realistic uh, problem to work with. And I should uh, highlight the credits here that go to HPC Carpentry, which uh, some of this is borrowed, uh, borrowed from. Um, exercise preparation. I will be working on my computer and that's what I would recommend all of you to do too. Uh, 
Samantha mentioned earlier Binder. It's a very nice online free service to launch, run computational steps or run to get to get a cloud instance, a lightweight cloud instance. If something breaks for you here, if, if it doesn't work, if SnakeMake isn't working, this is the fallback solution. You will learn more about Binder tomorrow, but if uh, running this on your own machine is not working, you can follow these steps. But I will run on my own computer and, and I would recommend you try to. So let's have a look at the, uh, the problem we're thinking about here. So a word count project, uh, it looks like this. Samantha showed you. Under source, we have three scripts. One to count words, one to plot, one to run the SIF test to check the frequency, the ratio of frequencies of their most common words. And the this is using the data here. This, these are public uh, domain books. You can have a look at them if you want. It's just uh, the full books, text of the books. So I, uh, let's see now, did people already import it? No, they probably didn't import it. So I will show how to import this repository. I will have to do something here. I will just have to resize it for a second. If you click the link up here in the word, uh, let's see, this link here, github.com, code refinery word count, you will be taken to this repository. And this is a template repository. So what you should do is to use this template. If you click use this template, it takes you here and you can choose where to uh, copy it to. You will choose your own username and give it a, you can write word count here. So count, I only did this, so this is not available to me. I could call it word count too. Part of the, uh, only part of the windows going off the shared screen. Is that yeah, expected? it's because I wanted to show where the, the button was. Okay, uh, sounds good. So then you just create the repository from the template. You press this green button here. And currently awesome. everyone should type along with you, correct? Yes. Should follow also the instructions. Yeah, thanks for the reminder. I will just do this, word count two, because I will show all the steps. You can call it word count. It generates the repository. This is different from forking. This is not, so what happens now is that we have uh, only one commit. So the full version history of the template repository is gone and we only have one commit which contains everything. And this is useful if you need a template with a particular structure that you can use for other projects, for example. Anyway, you will clone this. Uh, so unfortunately I have to change the size of the window to get the button here, uh, but you, you clone it with SSH keys if you have them, otherwise go for HTTPS. So I did it here in my terminal, git clone my repository. I'll just give everyone a few seconds to do this. Okay, so if you're not quite here, you can catch up later. There will be an exercise where everyone gets to, to practice these steps. So I will enter my word count directory here. This is the, the directory, uh, the listing of files and directories. Let me go back to the episode. So the scripts are under source. And let's just see how the workflow looks. So the workflow is the following one. These are Python scripts. So I type Python source slash word count. And then I give it an input file. Let's take one of these texts here. 
and then I give it an output file. So I will call it the same name, ielts.dat. What happened? Let's have a look at this folder process data. Let's have a look at this file, just the first few lines of it. Use the head command. You can also, well, you don't have to do this. I just want to show the contents. It, it has counted the words. It gives the number of times it appears and so on. Next step, if you want, is to make a plot. Just uh, a note here um, yeah. that if you are working in an unknown um, repository like we are now, you can also, to find out like what uh, Thor is doing right now, like he's putting in the, the word count.py and then some input and some output, he knows that because he has used it before, but you can also find that information in the, in the doc documentation of the code. Yep, and this, this project is documented. So we'll come back to that in the documentation lesson. So anyway, to, I, I'm just uh, running these commands that you see in the lesson material. I use the plot script. Now I use the that file that was just created in the, step, or in the earlier step. And then actually this is a typo. It should be results. Doesn't matter too much. I'm just demoing this. I uh, will create a, a PNG file, a figure. This uses some Python packages for plotting. Results. I have this image here. You don't have to open it. I'll just show it to you. It's the histogram. Anyway, so last step is to run this uh, zip test file, this script here. And again, we use this word count file. I run this and I get the result. So th this is the number of the frequencies of the first and second word, most common words, and then the ratio. So it's not quite true, as SIPS law would uh, predict, but uh, well, it's not too far away. So I don't know, can you relate to this? Uh, running multiple steps in sequence. First I do this, then I should do that. And then I do a plot and then I gather the, you know, collect the data and so on, the results. So this is a common workflow. You do things sequentially, one after the other. This is easy to do with one of these data files. But what if you have three books or 3000 books? You don't want to be doing this manually, obviously. And let's look at four hypothetical ways uh, in which how one could approach this. There are graphical. Um, sorry, yeah? there is yeah. a, one comment that it's a bit too fast, but maybe we can mention here that like you will be doing this as part of an exercise as well, and like it's not not necessary to to have the results of everything that Tor ran now for that exercise. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. So I, I, I say I would say that type along is optional uh, because there is an exercise where you do this yourself. I'm just um, yeah give, introducing the project, how how the project works, and now I will discuss four ways in which you could approach it if, uh, to automatize it. But thanks for pointing out that it was too fast. Um, so one way is some sort of graphical user interface. Uh, many exist to do data science and so on. Hypothetically, you would click on a script, you would select a book file, you would give a name of an output file, you then click a run symbol, something like this, and then you do this over and over. That's one way you could do this. The other one is using manual steps, which I just did. Do it for one book, do it for the next book, third book and so on. This is imperative style. We tell the computer do this and then do that and then do that. Another way would be to make a script. So here's a so-called bash script. We have, I don't need to do this myself, but um, uh, we have a loop here, which loops over all our data files and then it runs them one by one. And this is a clear improvement. We have automatized it. We can even use some sort of wildcard uh, characters here so that we 
can have an arbitrary number of, of data files, which we analyze in this way. So we've achieved automatization. That's great. This is still imperative style. We tell the script to run these steps, steps precisely in, in this particular order that we have in the script. The fourth solution, and this is the focus of the current episode, is to use a workflow management tool. And we are using, we will show you SnakeMake. It's a very nice, cool tool. It's been around for some time. It's, uh, it's in Python, but it can be used to run. I mean, the tool itself is written in Python and installed as you would install Python packages, but you can use it to run any type of analysis using shell commands or scripts in any language executables. And, and um, it's, but I should say it's one of many. There are many different tools like SnakeMake out there, but um, it's a powerful one. And you can see if you like it and, uh, or if you want to have a look at other possible workflow tools out there. So how would this work now? Uh, you know the problem, we have these data files, the books, we count the words, we plot the counts, and we run this final step, which is to compute this ratio for, for testing SIP's law. So this is will look like a lot of jargon to you initially, but let's study this file. It's, it's the snake file that you actually have in this repository. If I have a look in the repository here, there's the snake file. Okay, so it starts off with defining some data. This is a function that comes from SnakeMake. It makes a listing of everything under the data folder. It has some sort of wildcard here. Book can be anything. It can be any TXT file in this particular folder. And then we extract this book feature. So this will, what this will actually do is to pick out these names here, Abyss, without the ending, txt, idles, and so on. This is a particular thing that is needed on HPC resources. I will not go into it here. Uh, there are, there's an access, optional exercise below on running SnakeMake on HPC. This is, on the other hand, quite important. This is the first regular rule. So rules are uh, the building, block, uh, building blocks of um, SnakeMake files. And by default, SnakeMake will evaluate the first rule only. It runs the first rule. But the idea, the logic here is that the, the rule, the first rule will define a, an input. Uh, using the input keyword here, it, this is a dependency of this rule. And when SnakeMake knows this, it will figure out based on the definition of all the other rules, what step steps need to be taken, which rules need to be executed and in which order in order to generate this particular file here. So it looked at the rest of the rules. There was, there's one rule here to count the words. It's just running the same word count script that we did manually before using some particular data file, some output file and so on. So I will not dwell too long. This might be confusing if you haven't seen this before. There are some strange, uh, yeah, this wildcard and so on. But I just want to give you a very conceptual high level view here. So there's the rule for counting words. There's another rule for making the plots. We also did that manually before using the, the plot count script. And then finally, there's this rule for the, the SIP test script here. And at the very end, there's a rule to make an archive. And the output of that rule is this tar.g7 file. And SnakeMake figures out the order in which to run these rules to generate the final result, zip analysis.tar, which was required uh, for, for the top level rule here. Um, yes, and we have these keywords, input, that's the dependencies of the rules, output, that's the target, that's what gets generated by the rule. You can have this log if you want to preserve the output, the, some logs from the computation. And finally, the shell keyword here is the actual command which gets run in order to generate the output 
from the input. Um, I will just demo how this looks. In the, you don't need to type along, but you can if you've caught up with me. So snake make, it's a command which hopefully has been installed as part of your code binary environment. There's this, there's this delete all output flag. This is simply a way to remove all the stuff that has been generated from previous runs. So I already ran this once manually. So we'll have some stuff I can do delete all output. If I do it without the, this second flag minus J, it will complain. And that's because you need to specify the maximum number of CPU cores. So as you will see, this can run things in parallel. I will just run it with one job, J stands for job. Snake make now looks into uh, these uh, folders and deletes whatever results, uh, result files were there. And then I want to run the full workflow. I was just tidying up. Now I will run the workflow. Snake make minus J one. This will automatically read from a file called snake file. So the file is already called snake file. It will read, read it and figure out what to do. Okay, lots of stuff is happening. It's making plots. It's making more plots. It's doing all these things from the snake file. My CPU is very busy right now with uh, Zoom and everything, so it, it's taking a while. Let me just scroll up to the very top. Here, Snake Make prints a listing of everything that will be executed. It it found it found all these rules, and it identifies how many times it needs to run each. So count words will be run four times for the four different inputs. The make plot will also be run four times for the four different in inputs, uh, and so on. So in total, eleven jobs were run, and this is actually what we would have needed to type out manually if we were typing Python source. Etc. Let's have a look at the results folder. It created the, the image files and it created the final results file here. Yeah, a listing, listing of the books and the ratio. So SIF's law is, is not too far off. I mean, it's sort of almost distributed around two. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is to show you how SnakeMink is being used and um, what do I want to do? Yes, I want to show you what happens if I type SnakeMink minus J1 again. I type it again, nothing to be done. So if we would use a regular script, a bash script or some sort of script to execute our workflows, it would run everything again. And it took a few seconds on my machine. Of course, it could take minutes or hours in other cases. So uh, the script would simply run everything again. The cool thing now about SnakeMake is that it realizes that everything, all the results, all the, all the targets have already been created. So there's no need to generate, to run the workflow again. Let, let me demonstrate one thing. Um, let's touch a file. You can also just delete the file. Touch is a command, a Unix type of command, which modifies the timestamp of a file. It, it, mod it makes it look as if it was modified somehow. I will just touch this file. There's a different command on Windows, uh, which you can find in the exercise below. Touch this file. And now I rerun snake make. Okay, something happened. What did it do? It ran two jobs. It reran uh, only the top level uh, rule and the make archive rule. So snake make has now figured out what it needs to, to do. It analyzes the timestamps of all the files and knows based on the recipe and the snake file. Uh, it only runs the required steps. 
And also note that we have never actually told Snakemake that there's four books. We have yeah. only said there is some like a, some amount of text files in the input directory. Yeah. So we never actually really declared that we want these four books, but it finds all them of them automatically. Yeah, it's quite nice. And uh, this is not imperative style that we had before. It's declarative style. So we describe the dependencies between the inputs and outputs. And let Snake make figure out what steps need to be performed in order to produce the, the results, the targets. So why Snake make? There are many tools out there. It uh, has a somewhat uh, gentle learning curve compared to some other tools out there. Particularly if you compare with Make, some of you might be familiar with Make, the old GNU Unix utility to compile uh, software. But basically, you, you could use Make for this workflow too, but it would not be quite as easily, uh, not as readable as, as the snake, snake file. It's a free and open source tool. It's installable on different operating systems. It's used heavily in bioinformatics. It's, that's where it comes from, but it's a general workflow manager. Here is a, co a uh, comparison with the make uti utility. Uh, one thing which connects to what Samantha told you about before is that it integrates with package management. So sometimes you might have a rule that requires different, a different software environment, different libraries of Python or, or some other libraries and uh, or our libraries. Um, and you can specify that here, that this particular rule here should be run in a new Conda environment defined in this YAML file. Uh, one can visualize the workflow uh, using this minus minus tag option. But for this to work, you need to install something from GraphVis. I think this might be included in the code refinery Conda environment. So you might want to try this command. Uh, you don't have to, it's fine if it doesn't work. But have a look here if you, if you wanna uh, try to make it work. So the, it generates this DAG. Uh, DAG stands for Directed Acyclic Graph. And this is really how SnakeMake works. It, it generates this DAG internally and uses it to figure out the dependencies between all these uh, rules and targets. So what are the pros and cons of these different approaches, which are reproducible, which would scale, which can be automated? Well, the script, uh, the bash script automated the whole thing. Um, let me just take a sneak peek at the solution. So GUIs might or might not be reproducible. Probably they will require more work typing series of commands 100 times is extremely error prone and should be avoided. So these declarative workflows, like for example, Snake, make a great for longer multi-step analysis. And I, there was one thing I didn't really highlight, which uh, has to do with reproducibility again, and has to do with documentation. The very file itself, the Snake file, is some sort of documentation on, on what has been done. So this will enable uh, others to know exactly in which order steps should be run in a particular workflow, in a particular project. Anyway. I think I would like to move on to the exercise. Uh, let me just have a look, uh, what, how are we doing at the time? Yeah, we're late, but we should have the exercise, I think. Should have this exercise, yeah. So yeah. using Snake Make, hopefully it's, um, the, the description here is clear enough. Uh, you should, there are instructions for what to do. You should first have to clear, clear out all the output and then have a look, run these steps, do it yourself. Try touching files, you can also delete them and see what happens. Uh, touching or delete, no, well, you shouldn't delete it, but uh, if you update the timestamp of one of the source files, if you touch it, um, see what happens. 
And then you can use time uh, or similar if you're on a different operating system to try to time the execution of, of the workflow and see if you actually can speed it up. So try giving uh, J, uh, the J flag four to see if it can run in parallel and see if you save any time. Okay, that's it. Um, there are optional exercises. If you finish early, you can try to make this work with Conda. For example, having uh, the make plot rule run with a particular version of matplotlib and numpy and so on. And then if you're interested in, uh, probably you will not be able to do this now, but you can have a look at this optional exercise here. If you're interested on, on, in trying to make snake make work in, in a cluster environment. Okay, with that, I think I should uh, leave the leave you up to leave you to do this exercise uh, on your own. I think it, we had fifteen minutes allocated, so yes, until zero zero. Yeah, or twelve infinite. And uh, ask questions via HackMD, and there will also be a status bar where you can indicate if you're done or if you need more time. Okay, see you back in fifteen minutes. Okay, uh, welcome back. I realized that there was little time for a big topic. And of course, um, well, partly that's the idea. Uh, we can only give you a hint of what is possible here. There were many questions in HackMD on, you know, is this better than a Jupyter Notebook or a Bash script or something? And the answer is sometimes, sometimes not. It's, it depends. Uh, I mean, the bigger and more complicated the workflow is, the bigger is the need for some sort of workflow management tool. And SnakeMake has many good features, many good um, aspects. And if it looks interesting to you, you can look into it. But of course, it's a matter of taste. Um, yeah, so I hope you had fun with this. There's nothing more to say about SnakeMake. We will try to answer all your questions in HackMD and try to resolve any possible confu confusing points. But with that, I will give over the word to Samantha to discuss uh, containers. Yes, thank you. Um, so now we have learned about the, the workflows and all the uh, dependency management systems and what we can do for reproducibility. And Another level that we can uh, enhance the reproducibility of our code, of our stuff that we're doing, uh, is using containers. And uh, with containers, you can really bundle all the necessary ingredients that you have for your workflow, for your code to run um, into one place. So you can have the data, you can have the code, and also the full environment of uh, where and how your code works. Uh, you can have packed into a container that you can share with others that others can reproduce. And uh, this container, it provides something called operating system level virtualization. So the only thing uh, shared with the host is the, the system's kernel. And then uh, we have the container on top where you have the data, the code, the environment um, that can be shared with others. And you might have heard about Docker, for example, as uh, one container implementation and another that if you're working on uh, high performance computing systems uh, is singularity. Um, so Docker, basically uh, all, all the operating systems can use. And it is one of the mechanisms on how we can send our computer to the data. So we have set up um, our computing environment and we know how it works we know that it works and we have for example the data somewhere on some some data archive and so we can send our container there to do the processing if you uh, cannot or uh, want not to send your um, your data over the network so instead we can send our computer there um, there is something called the docker hub and we have here the link you can check that out um, on the internet where you can share Docker images where others have maybe are, uh, already created. And I will get back to what is an image in a moment. I just noticed that I've mentioned it now for the first time. 
um, so where you can share your own Docker images, where you can get Docker images from other people that they have created. So if you have, for example, problems installing a certain software, you can go on Docker Hub, see if some, someone has created a Docker image for it, get it, uh, run it on your own computer, and you can have the software on your computer without dealing with the installation stuff. Um, and then you can imagine that if you have, uh, or maybe we go now down here to the to the container versus image versus recipe, because I've mentioned it now. Um, so the image is like a like a blueprint of a container. It is immutable, so it's always the same. What you put on Docker Hub, it's like the same for everyone. Everyone can get it. And if you then use the image, uh, so you run it then you create a container on your own, com on your own uh, computer. And um, then you can do stuff within the container. You can use it to run a software. You can use it to run a workflow or something like that. And everything you do in there is um, gone once you like exit the container or once you stop the container from running. And the image is still there. It's still the same what you got from Docker Hub, for example. And um, you can like, create a uh, container based on an image from, for example, Docker Hub um, with a, with a so-called Docker file, which is a recipe where you say, OK, I have this software from Docker Hub. Uh, this uh, has this image there. And uh, I want to add a few so-called layers on top of it uh, to run my workflow. So I can run this, write this down in a Docker file. Um, and then everyone else can, can reproduce it afterwards. Um, for ex one example of the use of a container is, for example, for me, I, I don't have RStudio installed on my own computer because I never use R. But um, I might get tickets from users that use R and have a problem with it. Um, and I want to help them. So, and I know that our studio, for example, is available on Docker Hub. So I could use uh, this command here to get an our studio uh, image from the Docker Hub to my computer, run our studio in it without uh, the whole our studio installation ever touching my whole system. Uh, so it's a nice way of like getting something that might be a bit more complicated to install to run on your own computer. And uh, that's one advantage, but it can also be a disadvantage because that makes maybe people lazy that uh, you, you know that you can provide this Docker image. So um, why would you care about making, uh, making your software easily installable? Um, and to one ad another advantage is like you, you can eliminate this uh, works on my machine situation. So that we have like, like uh, with workflows, for example, like I have run it on my machine, it works everything fine because I have a specific environment that I run the workflow in, but someone else might not have this environment set up exactly as I have. So um, with the container, we can have the same environment. So it should work on both uh, machines. And um, if you are interested in it, I know this is now another tool and very, very short intro to it. Sorry for that, that we don't have more time. But um, the best way to learn how to deal with containers and how to also get an idea about these abstract things like images, uh, Docker files and containers is when you actually need it. So whenever you are in a situation that you want to install a software and you Google how to install this software, it does not work here and there. Um, and the answer is like, use this container from Docker or use this image from Docker Hub. And then it's a good point to get into it, try it out, play around with it. Um, there is also one exercise here uh, that you can try without installing Docker to your own computer because installing Docker might also sometimes be a bit um, of a hassle. So you can create a Docker Hub account and could then go to this play with Docker website where you can pretend that you have Docker installed on your own computer. And then you can get 
different images from Docker Hub. You can run them and you can see what happens there. So I highly suggest to do that maybe after the course um, and then get familiar with Docker when you have a use case for it. So this is more that you that you know about it. And I guess with that, I'll give back to Thor for the last part of this lesson. But please ask about it in HackMD if you have any questions relating to this. Yep, keep the questions coming in HackMD. We don't have time to cover all de any details here, but we can try to answer as good as possible in HackMD. So this is the last part. Uh, we're almost at the end of this lesson. And uh, after that, we'll have a short break and then social coding. But this one is somewhat important. So there's an exercise, which I think would be a good idea for all of us to try to do. So sharing code and data. Of course, we've been sharing code on GitHub so far. You can do it on other Git services too, uh, but there's more. You can share. You can share more. And this uh, has to do with the open science movement. Um, th there are multiple uh, uh, multiple parts to it. You can share data, open data, open source, open methodology, and so on. I will not go into the arguments before or against openness in science. This will be covered uh, to some extent in the next, next lesson on social coding. Uh, there are some links here to Wikipedia, which are often brought up in the, in the discussion. We heavily lean towards open science being the right way forward. But there, of course, there, there's a discussion out there. This cartoon just illustrates what openness enables. So you get an idea, you gather data, you analyze data, and then you make everything uh, available in one way or the other. And we'll see one way to make both code and data available and uh, 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 referenceable online. It will enable other people to re reuse it, come up with their own ideas, complete another cycle. So there are many advantages to, to openness, to open data and open, open source. I just want to briefly mention the FAIR principles. You might have heard about it. FAIR is an acronym. Uh, stands for findable, accessible, uh, interoperable, reusable. So it's often applied to data. Um, and uh, there's a strong recommendation for any data that is shared to be fair, but it also applies to software. So findable, will anyone know the data exists? Accessible, once you know it exists, can they get it? Interoperable, is the data in a format that can be used by others? Reusable, is there a license that enables others to reuse data or software? So let's, I, because I don't want to take time away from the important last part of today. So let's have a look at this exercise. Connecting repositories to Synodo. What is Synodo? It's, it's an online repository, uh, an archiving service, uh, which you can connect with your GitHub or GitLab account. It's created uh, by CERN and this open air project. And it enables you to create DOIs, digital object identifiers, which make a permanent record of your data and or your software and makes it easily findable by other people and makes it possible for others to cite you. And maybe that's the credit that you can get out of it. Making your data and software findable and, and citable uh, gives you bonus points in the system, yeah? So here's, how this exercise works. Uh, there, Synodo, there's a real Synodo platform, but there's also the sandbox service. Uh, that's like a test environment. Let's hope it's online and sometimes it's not up, but it seems to be fine now. What you're supposed to do is to go to the login page and log in with your uh, GitHub username. And you will, uh, I think, be asked to uh, allow this, uh, allow uh, Synodo to use your GitHub account. And then you go to uh, this link here, settings slash GitHub. 
I will open these links myself. And well, maybe I shouldn't do the exercise for you before you start, but I just want to show you that you will see a list of your repositories because you have now synchronized GitHub with, with your Zenodo uh, 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 login. And you can, for example, find the word count project that you imported before that we were looking at in, during Snake Make and flip the switch. There's a switch, flip it to on. And then next thing you do is to go to GitHub and you create a release. So you will find this on the repository page, create a new release on the right-hand side of your repository. And there you will be asked to create a tag um, and then you can create the release. And when that happens, when you created the release, it triggers Synodo, or actually in this case, this sandbox test server to archiving your repository. It archives it and gives you a DOI this will not be a real DOI, it's a fake one because it's on the sandbox service. And there you can press a button to get some markdown code, uh, which links to uh, a nice button symbol and so on. And this is how you, this you can copy paste into your GitHub readme file. I hope this wasn't too confusing. I think uh, try to do this by yourself. All the steps are documented and then after you're done in 10 minutes, I just very briefly uh, wrap up and uh, yeah, and then we have a short break. So keep questions coming in HackMD if this was confusing, um, but let's take a 10 minute exercise now until 25 minutes past the hour. Okay, welcome back. Again, I realized that there's always too little time to do important things, but uh, the good news is that the material is there. You can do this at home after the workshop and uh, uh, ask tomorrow if there's anything you get stuck with, for example. So this is for wrapping up now this episode. I just want to uh, mention that there is a list of different platforms. There's not, Sonodo is not the only platform out there. There are many other international ones. And here is a collection of uh, services in the Nordics because we are a Nordic project originally. And there are other, of course, internationally. So if you know of, if you're using a different platform, send a pull request to these repositories and we'll add it. There's uh, some further readme, uh, interesting material that you can read at home, some uh, links here. I just want to point you to one, sorry for the scrolling. I just want to point you to an optional episode here. If you go back to the main page of the lesson, there is this creating and sharing a container image. It goes into much more details on containers. If that was interesting to you, I recommend you have a look. It actually containerizes the word count project. I think that was it uh, from us. Uh, there will be a short break, five to 10 minutes before we resume with uh, social coding. So I hope you learned something interesting. There was a different, um, different approaches to reproducibility, different tools. We realized that there was another, and you know, why should you adopt new tools? You're already do doing quite well as you, as you are. Uh, well, it depends on, on your project again, and uh, workflow management tools are good for big complicated workflows. Organizing your project is always a good idea, regardless. Containers are good for some problems and so on, but this is just to give you a, a short overview and you can dig into the details uh, after the workshop if, if you find it to be useful to you. Okay, so five to 10 minute break and um, we'll be back on with social coding. Thank you. 35. Thank 35. you everyone.